Welcome. It's a Mrs. Video Show, or I call it the radio show for some reason. I got Josh Greenbaum, returning champion, back in action. How are we doing? Returning champion? I must have won <laughs> something I didn't even know. Okay. I'm doing great. Thanks, John. It's great to be back. We got, we got hats today. We got hats. And and also, this is a special edition. This is a blogs that matter edition. Because every now and then, someone gets yeah. off their butt in the enterprise and writes a really kick-ass blog. It doesn't happen that often outside of Diginomica, I'm sorry to say. Oh, sorry, that was the shameless plug. But it does happen sometimes, and this time it happened with Josh. Death to all silos is the name of the blog. A devastating critique of the state of the enterprise. Josh, welcome, and congratulations on writing a kick-ass blog. There's your uh, yes. Oh, thank you. Well, yeah, yeah, I got off my butt, you know, and did it. Thank, um, it was inspired, I have to admit. Um, with with aphorisms, no less. Yes. So, so, uh, so, folks that are, oh, hi, Merlene, how we doing? Welcome. She's saying hi to both of us. Oh, hello. Uh, yeah, this is going to be a good one, Marlene. I hope you're. Hope you got a nice hello. beverage. Feel free to contribute to the chat. As always, you can throw pot shots into the chat. This is a jugular program that actually values interaction instead of the faux interaction you see on crappy webinars every day. Um, what what we're doing is a little bit different today because while well, Josh has been on the show before, we've also got a new debut. We've got the very smartest man in the room is going to be high in park <laughs> in 45 minutes. He's going to join because he has some comments on silos in the enterprise as well. So he gets rewarded for, for pressing the issue on LinkedIn with a very interesting survey from Microsoft on the siloed remote work so we're going to have some discussions with him so that's going to be fun <clears throat> so definitely stay tuned for that oh and by the way i i got approval to interview a gartner person on my show after jumping through multiple pr hoops so that's going to be fun but that's not for this week this week we're bearing down on on silos and the the thing we're what we're going to do here is get to the bottom of what josh's critique is hopefully and then also uh we are going to talk about what to do about this dilemma so we're going to start with how how much things suck, but then then I'm going to press Josh on what we're going to what we're going to do about it. And just to give you a little bit of a flavor uh, as, as we get into this. Oh, oh, by the way, Josh has sprinkled the blog with uh, aphorisms. So so uh, we can talk a little bit about that, like uh, the lessons um, to be learned here. Um, and I, I'm just struggling because the URL for this did not come out right. It has like this weird pocky URL, but I will get a link out to the blog post in just a little bit. Um, but in the meantime, I just want to quote briefly from the blog. Josh starts out, the more I look into the problems of technology and service of the enterprise, the more I see the insidious hand of siloed technology, siloed business processes and siloed employees wreaking havoc across the business world. Yikes. And then we go to the end of the post and we get this. I'll close with the final, final aphorism. Josh's 11th aphorism of enterprise software. Vendors oversell, SIs underdeliver, customers pay. Ouch, Josh. Ouch. And call it like it is. I'm sorry. That is true. Um, I think. I think. You know. It's unfair to say it's always the case universally, and everyone's guilty, uh, regardless of any attempt to prove innocence. But yeah, there's a lot of overselling, under delivering, and and overpaying. It's it's so much. You know, we've talked in the past about the culture of mediocrity. I mean, to a certain extent, this is a there's a Stockholm syndrome going on here as well, where this is seemed to be okay. That's maybe why the spleen that got got loosened in this one, uh, you know, because it's not okay. It shouldn't be okay. We should, should be pissed off about this. So this is a really interesting post, I would say, because on the one hand, it does appear that you've kind of blown a little bit of a gasket in this post. And <laughs> I think I kind of proved that from a couple of the excerpts I read. Um, and But then at the same time, when I read through the aphorisms, it also feels almost like this is an expression of your, uh, I don't want to get too dramatic, but your life's work in the enterprise. It feels to me like, and we've talked about this, but you could, you could really use this post as a framework for a book as well, I think. And so this is an interesting balance. Calling all agents. Yes. By the way, yes. if there are any agents on this call, you know, this is a, DMs are open. So this is a really interesting thing because you did kind of blow a gasket, but this is also almost like a kind of a framework for thinking about the enterprise, right? It's, it's kind of both, right? 
it, it's you know again I I I have no shame and total pride in the gasket being blown because I think this is absolutely where we are. This is the state of the industry, and you know it, if if I thought it was getting better, I would be a little more optimistic. But I keep running into you know new marketing campaigns, new product introductions, new initiatives that you know just essentially are reiterating this concept of you know we're we're going to narrow cast what we think about the enterprise to fit our needs and not to fit what the customers need. And that's, you know, that's the thing that, that really you know gets under my skin as, as the blog post apparently indicated. So, and, and I think so. in, in a sense, you could have written this post five years ago or 10 years ago, because I think part of the theme of the post in a way is like the more things change, the more they stay the same in a certain sense with this underlying problem. But so, so that gets to the issue of what caused this post right now? Did you wake up one morning and find yourself uh, asked to submit a new contract to a vendor that had a 20 page addendum? Uh, did, did you uh, come off the phone with a customer who was having a crappy, like, like what, what tipped the scales here? Why now? I guess, you know, it's, it's, um, inspiration, you know, doesn't necessarily have a, you know, a hard and fast, you can't point at the muse and say, here she is on my shoulder. Right. Thing. But this has been building for a long time. And I guess, you know, I, I, I was recently in a customer, an end customer situation where, where this problem was not only prevalent, but there was a vendor again in, you know, getting in the way um, of a partner who wanted to fix the problem for the customer because the partner was encroaching on the customers, I'm sorry, the vendors, you know, uh, crown jewels is a term we've heard before in this world. Um, I, but it's, it's, it is honestly something I, I confront every day. And again, I look at marketing plans for new products and new customers. I look at everything that I see in the enterprise software space and say, here we go again. It's, you know, we're, we're narrowing our point of view and forgetting what the customer really needs, which is some customer thinking, customer centric thinking, not vendor and product centric thinking. So right. uh, yeah, there was no particular catalyst. It's just sort of mm -hmm. uh, other than the fact that maybe it was time to write another blog post. Uh, and, 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 but, 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 but serving customers better and having more of a customer centric view, I think is like a classic sort of thing to call out, but what made you hone in on the issue of silos? Well, it's, it's, I guess because I really, you know, when I look at how we want to digitally transform the world, um, and it, it's really boiling down to, you know, thinking broader about what what is the experience we want to give to the customer, to the internal employee, to the partner we're working with, uh, whether, again, that's in a supply chain context, in a service context, in a product, product manufacturing context. And this these, these these experiences and are are based on end-to-end -end processes that really need to be, you know, to use all the buzzwords, as seamless and well integrated as possible. And it just doesn't happen enough. And it's just continuously banging my head against the wall because digital transformation, you know, is a, the concept is assaulting us in this, you know, fire hose continually. But when you peel away the edges, or I guess you know, get get out of the way of that, that stream a little bit, you see the same old stuff. You still see these, these points where my my bailiwick ends here, my authority ends here, my my it's you know, this is about me and my you know, my bailiwick and, and I'm not responsible for the other stuff. I'm not responsible for fixing it, I'm not responsible for owning it, I don't care, I'm not incented. And again, this that's why I, I really picked on all three parties because it, it cuts a all across the board, um, it's it's just um, you know I have a few you know I'm, I'm of a certain age where I start thinking about where you know where is this all going to end for me professionally and this is a big problem. I'd love to I'd love to be able to say yeah I had some impact on fixing this. Boy, is it it's everywhere. Right, and and by picked on all by saying you picked on all three parties, your post picks on. <laughs> Then software vendors, SIs, and and sort of challenges customers to step up as well. Um, yeah. I think one of the one of the, I think the, the more most disconcerting points you make in your critique is that 
silos are actually in the vendor's best interest. That's that's a hard pill to swallow, Josh. Can you elaborate on that? Well, you know, I think I, I, maybe I, I, I'll temper that <laughs> comment by saying it's, it's not necessarily in their best interest, but it's certainly in their standard operating procedure that that's how they, mm. that's how they, that's how they run. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'd say again, collectively, it's not, you know, if you look at any of the, any of the large enterprise software vendors, uh, pretty much any of them at these ones, they have a suite of, of products. They have a, a story to tell that could be about how do you integrate all this stuff. Um, but they're not, they're not organized to think that way. They're not organized to build product necessarily that way. They're certainly not organized in the field to sell that way. So they, they're sort of, you know, I would, I would argue that, and I think I, you know, I said this in the blog post, it is in their interest to be customer centric such that they step up to the plate and say, we're here to help you regardless of, you know, the heterogeneity in your enterprise, which is where this silo thing comes from. Um, but the, um, the structure doesn't support that. And, you know, another aphorism I think I left out of there was um, all great, I, all great ideas from marketing go to the field to die. Um, and that's, Ouch. you know, well, again, you, you talk, you and I talk all day long with marketers who have these great ideas about how this stuff is supposed to work in the real world. And then you hear from the customers what the AE was selling them to try to close the deal and, and close the quarter. And yeah, uh, those are completely disconnected. Interesting comment from Bonnie Tinder, who knows a little something about this. By the way, a frequent guest on my show. Thanks, Bonnie. Yeah. Silos are easier for vendors to operate in because many times their product growth is based upon acquisition. Ouch. Yeah. Well, it's it's Bonnie speaks the truth again. Uh, thank you, Marlene. Yes. Um, yeah, it, it's an acquisition strategy. To, and, you know, we can dive into that, right? The classic acquisition, I mean, computer associates used to do quite the opposite, but most nowadays you, you buy, you don't just buy product, you buy a sales force, you buy a customer base, and you don't want to break the brand and subsume it under your brand. So you keep them out there as a, as a separate entity. And that separateness uh, is kind of self-perpetuating. Um, and, you know, the, immediately the elbows come out and people start defending territory because you know, and that's internal structures. They're defending a budget that they won't get. They're not incented to share their budget or their aspirations with other groups. They're not incented to, to play well with others. They're incented to make things better for what's inside their domain. Um, yeah, and, and maybe it's better to reframe your, your prior point around that this is actually in vendor's best interest. Maybe it's kind of like in their short-term sales interest that it kind of works. Um but but it's right. not necessarily in the in the long when you spin it ahead a few years out it's not going to make them look good as we reevaluate these projects so right. that short term long term conflict perhaps is one way to think about it and oh and and Bonnie comments on I am Park on the super interesting study around this is around silos and in, in collaboration and remote work uh, and just to note we're going to get to that later on when when Hyun joins us live so I'm saving that piece for now. Um, but I do want to tie this in this post in a little bit, Josh, to another landmark post you made a while back that we also did a show about on extreme heterogeneity, because right. there's a relationship between the two, right? Because what you're trying to say is that on the one hand, you have these silos that are anathema to progress. On the other hand, you have, especially the large enterprise, I would argue, this heterogeneity that that companies are are either attached to or it's not going away anytime soon. And, and, and vendors right. need to learn how to play in that framework and they often don't, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it, again, it depends on the, <clears throat> excuse me, the class of vendor. If you are, you know, if you're, if you're a, <clears throat> an all cloud CRM vendor, you understand that you've got to live in a heterogeneous world because, you know, the, the, walling yourself off in CRM isn't going to work. Same thing with HR and other spaces. But even those major vendors, <clears throat> excuse me, have done enough acquisitions, they're spreading their wings as well. As well. And, you know, Salesforce owns MuleSoft for a very good reason uh, to, to enable that. So it, it's, it's endemic. And um, the, 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 the idea that, you know, again, in the marketing literature, all roads lead to digital transformation as long as they go through my product, 
is really the thing I'm fighting against. It's just not the reality of, of the situation. And, and you know, as I said in the blog post, the, you know, this is a, you know, for the old, the old, uh, the old biology line, right? Uh, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. You know, you, you, you create a structure called silos to sell product. And soon enough, you re that's replicated inside the companies themselves. So you have the, you have the ERP silo. You're selling ERP to an ERP guy. He buys the ERP. Over here, there's the customer, you know, the customer relationship folks and, and the VP of sales has nothing to do with that guy over there. She's got her own priorities. She's running her own product, et cetera, et cetera. And so when it comes time for those two to have to theoretically sit in the room and transform the enterprise and have that end-to-end -end process, the ERP guy shows up and says, well, I, you know, here's what my vendor, you know, my vendor of choice says. And by the way, that means your CRM sucks. And the CRM person, she's like, well, you know, I don't even need your ERP. Your ERP is just a commodity. And pretty soon you just have this, this turf battle going on to defend your individual priorities. And I unfortunately don't see, and maybe there's a, maybe where we go with this is, you know, create a job category that is, you know, the ombudsman or the, the integrate, you know, internal integrator. But I mean, some people think it's the chief digital officer should be doing this. I'm not sure, but um, the, right. yeah, you, you get this, you get this, you know, this kind of recursive reflective problem. It doesn't, it, doesn't go away. It just gets worse and worse. Yeah. And in just a couple of minutes, I want to get into sort of this notion of constructive solutions, because to your credit in the post, I think you laid out some good steps. Uh, but before we do that, I want to, I want to just drive. Tra before we do that, we have to keep trashing. But, before yeah, we do okay. that, I want to just drive home just the despair of the predicament that we're in uh, <laughs> to really like lay this out. I'm going to read from your post, Josh. Only a few Maverick CIOs, CEOs, and LLB execs care to know what a real heterogeneous end-to-end -end process could do for their company. Only a handful of really smart salespeople can actually put aside their quota-driven mindsets and help a customer succeed on the customer's terms. And it's the rare systems integrator that relishes the chance to officiate over such a fortuitous and uncommon union. For everyone else, it's the same old, same old, misaligned goals, oversold and underdelivered products and services, change management that doesn't, and pervasive project failure after project failure, all because we, the sellers, buyers, implementers, and the punditocracy pointing a finger at ourselves here and yourself, can't stop rushing headlong into a siloed evolutionary dead end that contract after contract, pilot after pro pilot, project after project, we seem destined to perpetuate. Josh. That is devastating. Well, okay. That is just me, that's, me, that's devastating, man. Let's dive back a couple of years. Um, I started doing, a, I got interested in productivity, uh, productivity statistics, and I started looking at um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has some great data on, on productivity. You, you know, you can measure productivity of people, productivity of assets, or the combination. And there's a very famous quote from the, um, I think it's from the 80s, Robert Solo, a Nobel Prize winning uh, economist who said, you can see the effect of the uh, technology revolution everywhere, but in the productivity statistics. And I sort of took that to heart and started looking and I built a chart. I haven't updated in a few years, but you look at, I, I pulled out one of the big analyst firms, annual growth of, of tech spending, both domestically, US and international. And I plotted that on the chart and then I plotted it you know, against the Bureau of Labor Statistics Productivity growth data domestically, and, and then I pulled international data. And here you've got this spend thing that goes like growth that goes like this up and down. There's a recession, it goes down, but we're talking five. You can have years where you're five, 10% plus spend is increasing. Growth in productivity flat and usually under 2%, if not 1%. So, and that's 20th century. That's since the beginning of the century. So there we are. We're spending all this money on tech. You can see it. You don't have to. You, know, you can see it in the data, and we're not seeing net growth in productivity. Solo is still right. <laughs> you know, 30 years later, um, that started me thinking. Well, why the hell is that going on? And um, I would say that rant you just read is really the sort of the the catharsis <laughs> of, the, uh, of that moment. It's yeah. Well, if you if you want to take it very starkly and look at the macro data. Uh, you know, this is what you end up with. We're not, as a you know, as a whole, growing productivity the way we should. 
considering how much we're spending in particular. And then what are the root causes? Well, we, we don't get it right. We're not we're not applying technology correctly to the problem. Um, why aren't we? And then, you know, why aren't we is what this blog post is about. Uh, we have Ellen Berkson chiming in. Ellen, I want to uh, get with you separately on some topics. Just a side note, Ellen, a little to-do list. Uh, breaking down silos requires a long-term perspective, says Ellen. Too often, companies don't have the appetite or stamina to think past quarterly results. Good point, and that gets back to the short-term, long-term thing we were discussing a few minutes ago. A key part of the problem, right? I, and let me, I need to jump on Alan's comment and, and the short term long term because, of course, now we can start pointing a finger, which I didn't do, at the capital market. Because now, you know, when, when your job as a CEO, a vendor CEO, is to show up every quarter with growth, um, you're, you know, you're, what's, your, what's your window of, you know, what's your perspective? Every, you know, I got to turn it in every three months. I got to get that, those, you know, those, those quota carrying sales reps to kick it out of the park. You know, in that last few weeks, you know, the frenzy, we just passed that you know, milestone. It was the end of the third quarter. That's a huge one. Um, so you've got this mindset that says, give me more and more and more and more and more short term. People like you and me and Alan, I'm sure, and I know Bonnie as well, are saying, well, actually, if you're looking at it from the customer's perspective, value isn't expressed in three months chunks. That's Absolutely. a crazy way to look at it. The, the, Josh, I will say one of my bones of contention about our industry is how few public company CEOs kind of stand up to the capital market narrative a little bit and try to educate the markets as to why they might be interested in taking some short-term hits in the interest of long-term customer health and pushing back on that a little bit. I'm not saying that you can completely declare independence from the markets that fund you, yeah. but I'm disappointed sometimes in, in the lack of pushback in, in terms of constructing a narrative as opposed to kind of the slavish dedication to quarterly yeah. numbers used to justify all kinds of behaviors in the field. So anyway, yeah. but that's just a little yeah. issue. That Point I taken. Have. We agree. But, <laughs> uh, but, but, but anywho, um, I want to shift gears a little bit now because I think one of the things I really try to do on the show is to bring it back to the project perspective of what are we going to do about these difficult problems? Because I actually do think there are um, some things we can do to make the situation better. And you've outlined a number of them in your post. Before we get to a few of those, and I would also encourage the audience members to shift gears as well and share a few things that you think are working to help with this problem um, because it's way too much fun and easy to poke holes in this. It's a lot harder to be part of a constructive solution. Um, so, um, but let me just ask you one thing, Josh. Do you think that vendors have unleashed a Trojan horse on themselves in the context of customer success programs, because while customer success problems are often very vendor centric, aren't they kind of unleashing something that may turn back on them as a means of accountability, right? In other words, you go back to this a year or two later and measure the success and this information on these siloed miscues starts to surface, right? I mean, am I wrong in that, in thinking that, or is that too naive? Well, um, it's complicated, right? I, I mean, first of all, we, we've had measurements of success for a while. We know it doesn't, you know, we don't, we know net promoter scores suck in enterprise software. That's not new. Um, and, you know, I think that, that uh, the problem is, is that too many vendors are, are trying to solve this problem by just looking inside, <laughs> using tools, you know, look, they're not bringing the outside perspective that, you know, Bonnie is, Bonnie, thank you for being on the, you know, in the audience, Bonnie has a way of, of, of dealing with this, with these problems uh, with uh, Raven intelligence. And it's, it's about having an outside in perspective. It's about taking an independent third party to, to look at what is success, not to say, you know, I'm the VP of customer success and let me tell you how successful we are. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I, I applaud the, 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 the sort of mushroom like growth of job titles with su customer success in them. I'm, I'm not impressed with how these programs are incented to actually deliver real success. It sounds like it's window dressing most of the time. Right. Okay. But, uh, well, customer well, success is probably a topic that we could spend a whole show on. So we're not going to do that today. Yeah, no. Uh, but, um, or, or, or the initiatives that vendors are, are <laughs> flaunting. Uh, what I do want to do, though, let's let's spend about five minutes on each constituent group and what they can be doing about this. And let's start with vendors because that's how your post goes. You have right. six six constructive suggestions 
uh, for, for vendors? Do you want to mention a few that come to mind and I'll, I'll, I'll catch up with the rest, but. Yeah. Well, I, you know, the, my favorite is the first one and, and it's my favorite because I think it's beyond, it's not just painless. It's actually should be joyous, should be great, which is to cross pollinate what you're doing, you know, to bring these other lines of business into the conferences about your, your siloed product. If it's, you know, if it's procurement, if you've got a procurement centered, centered you know, event, bring some people from HR in because guess what? You know, you're now procuring contingent labor. That's part of what you do. HR needs to be involved in that. You also, if, you know, if you're procuring, you know, if you, if procurement procures other things, HR procures other, you, you start, bring, you know, I guess ERP is another one. ERP and, and sales should be together. They should be sitting in the same room at the conferences instead of having a conference that's about ERP, a conference that's about, about this. The thought process for that came from, from a revelation I had, you know, talking to supply chain VPs, uh, who to a man and woman will say more and more, my job is to deliver product to a customer. Um, what they understand about the customer journey is slim to none, but that's great. Let's, let's educate them. Let's bring them into a customer, you know, conference. So I like that one. I, that one's my favorite. I think it would really change the story and, and, and it, it would, Maybe put me out of business. That would be a good one too. Um, and I think you know. Okay, just stop and let you. Uh, uh, no, no. Uh, l- let's keep going. Uh, are are there mm-hmm. others that jump out? I'll, I'm going to go through all of them briefly. But are there others that jump out to you at, at the moment? Well, um, there. I think. I think the you know the having. I guess I'll, I'll jump to the last one because it's very self-serving. <laughs> Having an analyst core, cultivating also the outside in view from the analyst community that this is this big picture is important. I think it's really really needed. I think there's too many, too much, too much, and I say this where where the the punditocracy we analysts also play par, play a part in this compartmentalization mm-hmm. of of knowledge and you know having people who look at the big picture even if they're not you know if they a mile wide maybe an inch deep isn't enough, maybe only five inches deep, but we need people who have that mile wide, wide view. In addition to people who have a one foot wide that can go dive deep into the, the speeds and feeds of any individual car. I think that 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 matrix of, of, of analysis and understanding needs to be maintained. Right now, I think the predominance is in many analyst relations uh, programs to f- focus on the MQ, uh, to focus on we've got to be number one in our, this category. Um, and that category, you know, is great, but could, you know, you're just not going to buy any single category these days as a customer without thinking how the hell is that going to fit with the other parts of my business. So I, I think that that would be my other favorite. So let's, let's, let's expand the, the concept of what is, you know, what is analyst coverage to really reinforce this notion of, of, of the big picture is important. Absolutely. I mean, in my experience, most analyst relations programs either stink or are mediocre. Um, but it, but, but that's because my definition and criteria for that is, I think, is different than the vendors. I think, I think the vendors look at it in terms of things like ratings, recognition, uh, broadcasting, brand casting, market messaging, right. uh, a one-way sort of relationship in a certain sense, except for when the ratings come out. Um, whereas to me, it should be a two-way dialogue. Um, to, to, to help me to do my job better and to help vendors do their job better. Because the bottom line is that we don't deliver enough successful products in this industry and every constituent group is responsible for that in their own way. Um, at least that's what I think. Um, well, I'm just going to rattle through some of the rest of them because we've covered a lot of them, but you talk about, um, and feel free to look at the blog post for the details, but be supportive of your customers' complex heterogeneous landscapes. We checked on that. Modernize your partner strategy to focus on customer success. We'll get to that a little more in a sec. Change your sales culture to be focused on real customer success. Again, tying that in. Change how you measure success to include outside independent analysis. I think that's a critically important point in general, which I stomp on a lot in my work with yeah. Digenomic, is the need for uh, parties to be involved in project assessment who, who do not have the same financial self-interest as the main stakeholder group or the main approved vendor or SI. I think that's kind of a no-brainer at this point, but unfortunately it's not a reality in a lot of situations. Right. I have an aphorism for that one. 
Oh yeah, what's uh, your aphorism? Yeah. Sorry, we we, Every, we we keep skipping those. We got to get a few of those in there. It's everybody loves the idea of transparency and accountability until they find out it applies to them. Mm. And and that's you know that's that's the vendor, that's the systems integrated, that's the customer too. I mean, the problem is we, you know, it's difficult to hold that mirror up and look and you know look at look at what you see and and say uh, maybe I can do a better job. But but you know if you don't have transparency and accountability, you know it doesn't work. Um, and people shy away from that. That's a cultural problem that needs to be fixed. Well, I guess my question too would be, how do you measure progress if you can't do an honest assessment of where you stand, right? It's just like anything else. Like if, 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 if your doctor tells you you have to lose weight for whatever reason, don't you have to start with take, you know, getting on the scale? Yeah, right. right. Like there's, there's no way around that and no matter how, but, but I do see that vendors are loath to do that. And, um, but one thing I will point out in your list is you do come, come back to customer success a lot. So you obviously are a little bit like me in that you still have some faith that that these things can be done properly if, if they're not as tied to the vendor's self-interest. So, yeah, no, I, I, and, and, you know, I think, I think at the end of the day, you know, we have to think about this also as a, as a we need to change the metrics that we're using to evaluate success. Um, thank you, Bonnie. It's hard to throw stones when you live in a glass house. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately that applies to you and me too, but we'll, we yeah, just all to about that. that. Yeah. Um, the um, but I think you know, and this is this is where I think we we need to sort of re rethink. I mean, what is the measurement of success? Well, you know, unfortunately, the ultimate measurement is how did, did I make the quarter? That that one's got to go away. But we also don't have a measurements of success for did I, you know, did I really extend the value of an individual silo outside that silo? You know, is there you know, did I build the end to end process that really changed how things work? Did did I take Something like invoice reconciliation, boring and 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 you know non sexy or whatever you want to call it, and change it in a way that that not only you know not only makes it more efficient but also extends the value of the concept of what is a what does a good invoice look like? How do we make sure we get more of them? How do we fix these problems we may have with a partner, supplier, or customer? That those incentives aren't there because we're just looking at some of these basic fundamental old school KPIs that don't look at heterogeneity at all. Okay. We have three minutes to talk about what the SI should should do. What is their role uh, to take a constructive step here? W what's your favorite thing there? Just say no. Just say no. Don't, 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 don't say, okay, we'll take all the change orders on earth and, and make this thing look, I mean, how many times have you, I know, been in the room when they say, well, the problem with the project, the reason the project failed is because the customer convinced the SI to make the, the new software function just the way the old software used to, because we like that old stuff. And then you find, you know, you put, what's the opposite of lipstick on a pig? You've, you know, you've, you've taken something that should have been transformative and just made it the same old shit only, pardon my French, only, you know, now you've, now you've really garbaged in, garbaged out. Um, so just saying no, being that partner who says, you know, I may not make as much in time materials on this project as I could, but let's do the right thing. Uh, I, I would love to hear more stories like that. Yeah, and yeah. and one of one of your SI tips we've covered very well. I think open your work to transparency and accountability. So let's go to the one we haven't talked about, which is no more sell the A team, deliver the B team. Talk about that. Oh boy. Yeah. And again, Bonnie's got great data on that one. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, and, and it's interesting. I was just having a discussion with, with a customer who was struggling to find um, some resources uh, for a project. And, and, you know, there, this is, a, there's a, there's always been a resource constraint. Now it's even worse. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the, the sales process uh, doesn't, <laughs> doesn't mirror the, the, the actual implementation process. They do walk in there with, they put the smartest and the best looking people up front, they get the project and, you know, in the old model, they literally park the school bus up, you know, you know, in front of your IT department, and a bunch of kids come out and they, they're learning on the job. And I wish that was, you know, a, a incorrect, but it's all too often true. And, and it is a genuine, there is a talent problem that's being vastly outstripped by, a, by sales success, but mm. that all the more makes it, in, you know, incredibly important that you don't you don't oversell and under deliver because now you're gonna now you know now you're gonna get in the way of everything. Um, so yeah, say no and uh, don't sell the A team and B team. Be honest, brokers. 
it's kind of just simple, basic, good business in my view. And uh, Alan says, tools alone don't solve anything. Successful, successful customer success programs also focus on the people and processes to get the outcomes. I think that's really true, yeah. Alan. And the, the other thing I'm going to just add to that is, is that uh, I did a demo earlier this week. I'm not going to name the vendor, but I was really impressed because it, it was a classic quarter sort of value engineering thing. But the thing is that it wasn't centric to their solutions. So the recommendations being made weren't tied to the products. And I thought that was really powerful because so often these things are just like, I think that's the weakness with a lot of these so-called success programs is they always have a way of pointing back to using the vendor's products more extensively. Um, so stepping away from that would give a lot of vendors a lot more credibility in the market, I think. Yep. It would look good. You know, and that's in the end, and it would, you know, you can bring a partner in to, you know, as well. And, Yep. there's a lot of ways to play the game. Again, I think, I think being more, how can I say it? You know, I, I run a small business. I've been doing it for 30 years. If I was playing hard sell and, and doing some of these shenanigans, I, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. I would have been found another career a long time ago. So I couldn't get away with it uh, as a sole proprietor. Uh, and Bonnie's giving us some stats to back up your, your A team, B team thing, real life stat, 48% of projects, have SI team turnover, ouch. Um, turnover meaning the varsity project team got swapped out with G junior varsity mid-project. Bonnie Tender, ouch. That, well, and, and, and she's, you know, we were just, Bonnie and I were just involved, you know, working on something together where you, you, you know, it directly correlates with customer dissatisfaction with the project, end of story. You know, the, you keep taking my people out, the good people out and putting these, you know, the JV team in. I'm not, I'm not a happy customer. Uh, and for the very good reason that I'm not, my project's not going that well now. Folks, we have Liam Park backstage. He's going to be joining us shortly to weigh in on Josh's blog post and also a, a landmark study on remote work silos, uh, a subject that is on a lot of people's minds right now, I think. Um, before we get there, Josh, though, we do have to cover the, you said it takes all three parties to really screw up the project. <laughs> So you have a to-do list for customers too. What's your standout pick from that? Yeah, I'm looking. I have to look at it myself because they're so they're all they're all you know they're, they they jumble in my head together because they're all they're all I think pretty damn important. Um, I talked about the new set of metrics. I think that's important, but I, I really think you know building out a a, a, a job category, a title, a, a group that actually has responsibility. For, for integration of process, for integration of goals, for, for spanning the silos, I think is really important. Again, some folks think this is a chief digital officer's job, but there's so many, so many times I've been in the room with, with decision makers who, in the, in the corporate, in the customer space, who say, well, that's, I understand your point, but that's not, that's not my daily work. It's not, it doesn't affect my PL. I'm not, I have no particular incentive to do that. And unless you can, you know, and that forces a conversation either to die right there or to get escalated to a CFO or a CEO who hopefully has that perspective. Um, and we all know how long it takes to just get into those, you know, discussions. So if there were someone whose job it was to say, we are here to, you know, we're, I'm the silo buster. Uh, I'm, I'm here to blend it all together and make it work even better. If there was someone to sell that, you know, sell this concept to that would change a lot. Uh, that person has to have a lot of clout. That person has to have a lot of authority and and backup, and they have to have a vision um, that that that's rare but not impossible to have. Um, yeah. yeah, and and you had in these customer tips, you have one that I consider very hardcore and one that's visionary, and you just hit on the more visionary one, which is establish enterprise wide centers of synergy. The focus on holistic business practices that that would look interesting on a business card, Josh. Come on, we got used to chief evangelist and absolutely other silly things. So why not chief? What are we going to call it? Chief holistic uh, health, business health practitioner? I don't know. I like it, business health practitioner, particularly the development of end-to-end -end processes that aren't limited by your artificial silos. Your company needs, says Josh, a team that can look across silos. And build synergies, even if it means breaking down well entrenched tech and process silos. And then your key point there: be sure to endow that team with real authority to break through the silos, or they'll be ignored for sure. So, and then you bring the hammer down, Josh, 
work with vendors and SIs who get it, fire the ones who don't. Ouch again. You know, that's a dream because there's too much, you know, everyone's too entrenched to do that. But more and more, you know, there are going to be, I think the opportunity is there. I think when we're done, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're going to have to find these metrics and promote these companies, you know, the SIs and partners uh, and, and vendors who, who want to succeed based on genuine customer success, not, not on their quarterly, meaning their quarterly metrics. I think, I think the cream will rise to the top. I think this will start to work uh, because, you know, the alternative is to continue this march to mediocrity and the cadence uh, you know, of change is so rapid. What we just went through the last few years changed everything several times over you know, and and if we, we, you know, just just the idea that it, a, a COVID a COVID pandemic timeline is the average sales cycle for enterprise software, that's just insane. Who can wait a year and a half to finish a job? You know, you've got it. We've got to move faster, and so I think we're going to figure it out that faster means quality, and quality means faster. And then we have one more from Bonnie Duncan Tinder. Uh, agreeing with you, if a silo buster is in the C-suite, that is big. So she likes your concept of getting buy-in from above. Chief silo buster. Now we got it. Chief silo buster. I like that. Would look really cool on a on a car. Well. I, I want that. Actually, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna post that position and hire myself. I think that's a good Absolutely. One. So so yeah, we've moved from from a dystopian deconstruction of the enterprise to some I think some practical, you know, if, if bold uh, tips. But hey, you never got anywhere if you weren't bold in this industry, in yeah. this world. So you ready to bring on our special guest? Let's do it. All right, here we go. Let's see how this goes. Testing there one, is. two, three. We've got Hyun Park. How we doing? Hey, doing great. Uh, just been listening from backstage the past few minutes. A great cool. discussion. And Josh, uh, amazing blog. I uh, love how you, you are tearing Appreciate down it. the expectations of, uh, of the status quo that we've been stuck with in the enterprise. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank impressive you. bookshelf, by the way, I have to say. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Rating's good. <laughs> but, but, but have you have you read all those books? It's just the thing. They look, they look not, red to not me. Not there for decoration. <laughs> okay. All right. Excellent. I, I love that analog collection there. That that, that raises my spirits. Yeah. Uh, cool. plus, plus the right. fact that you've read them, and I actually believe you, is very cool. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but before, we, before we get to the topic du jour that, I, that we want you to weigh in on, I just want you to share with, with the viewers, how do you approach your role as an analyst in this industry? What, what, what do you focus on, but also what's important to you in terms of working with customers and vendors? How do you think of it? Yeah, so um, I, I agree with uh, Josh uh, d d uh, a lot here in that um, – the problems you find at the end user level do not fit very well into tiny little buckets. I remember back when I was a project manager in the IT world, I had to go back and forth between ERP, project management, budget. Uh, I didn't have one app that I used. So uh, to some extent, I see analysts who focus very narrowly on, say, uh, you know, data management or integration of catalog technologies or uh, sales operations uh, optimization with, without getting into the, the rest of the ecosystem, uh, to some extent have a very artificial view of the world. Yes, you get to define uh, what this specific software package is, but not necessarily uh, what somebody's job is. So uh, I try to get into the role of understanding uh, IT and data uh, roles. Uh, my, my specialties are in IT finance and uh, data and analytics. So um, I, I try to understand the role, not the specific application that is used and try to move from there in end user deployments. Because uh, yes, uh, otherwise you can get very stuck in uh, trying to uh, just recommend one specific product. And that's not not a great approach, uh, frankly, for the customer at the end of the day. They're, they're going to make a decision. They're going to get trapped in a corner. Yeah, agreed. Uh, one thing I'll say about Mr. Park here is uh, some of these analyst meetings that we go to are frankly a little dire, especially the QA segments where some of the questions are either what you refer to, very, very niche questions that are very, very like product minutia, 
or let's just face it, ass kissing softballs that are designed to reinforce the, the vendor's current retainer with the. So the good thing is whenever Mr. Park speaks up, I know it's going to be a good question, Josh, and he never disappoints. He's, he's on his <laughs> game. No, nope. uh, you too, John. So, Back so, at. so, so with that in mind, let's put, let's put high on the, on the spot here. Uh, what was your overall reaction to Josh's post? And do you have any probing questions for Josh on something you would like to dig into there? Yeah. So I thought Josh's uh, post was a great wake up call. The one challenge I do have for this post that is that I think it is a big uh, fundamental shift that you're uh, considering from the enterprise software sales process. Um, you know, frankly, we have all grown up uh, under these ERP silos, CRM silos, uh, planning silos, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you know, how do you actually close a deal from a practical perspective when you're trying to, uh, while still getting to solve these problems? Uh, I, I, I'm wondering if you've thought about that issue because at the end of the day, you know, people still do have to buy and sell things and make decisions that work. You know, how do we, how do we make that balance or, or, you know, <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you're right. It's, it's, you know, it's easy to sort of pontificate in, you know, in a blog post and harder to actually realize this stuff. And I think, you know, without a doubt, there has to be some shifting in the incentive structure um, of, of, of accounting tech. So I've always had this dream and some, some vendors are starting to do this where, you know, you get your bonus doesn't, show up in your paycheck until some milestone has taken place. Mm -hmm. um, go live may be it. I'm not sure go live is the right one. Uh, but but to, to you know, sort of build into the AE's mind that you're not just going to get away with closing the quarter by throwing some deals together and hoping it sticks because you ain't you'll make you'll make but it'll look like you made your quota, but you're not going to make it, you know, you're not going to make the bonus to go with it. So yeah. I think you can do some of that. Um, but you're right. I mean, it it does mean um, it does mean changing how ultimately how the vendor goes to market, and that's a big. That's not small. That's big. Um, absolutely. Yeah, I think he does get to the heart of the issue in your post, Bonnie. Duncan Tanner says yes. The last thing he wants to do during the sales process is to try to blow the ocean and introduce too much. Um, many of these initiatives do fall down when it comes to translating into field sales. And I'm, I'm fond of the, the, my view is that salespeople need to become advisors, but that doesn't happen overnight. Right. And not, right. not anywhere near. But, you know, I'll take a pedagogical view of this. We, we tend to disparage account executives as, as being, you know, not intelligent enough, frankly, to carry a complex conversation and, and I'm not sure that's true. I think we're selling a lot of these folks short. I think if we worked a little more closely, and I guess I just feel this about people. I feel this about dogs. If you you, know, you talk up to them, they'll turns out they'll rise to the occasion. I think we could also take an, a, a you know a field sales force and 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 upscale it. Um, we don't need, necessarily need to purge it and find a bunch of new PhDs to do this. My yeah, opinion. and. and I I, I don't want to, uh, you know, push too hard in that direction because, uh, you know, frankly, the best salespeople I've met tend to have good subject matter expertise. They just also have a great personality for selling and uh, are curious people, uh, you know, interpersonally uh, well-skilled. You know, th those are great salespeople. Um, you don't have to just sell, sell, sell. You know, this is just not just a used car lot that we're in. You know, we're trying to Hopefully, sell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I want to ask, I want to ask Kyan this question and Josh, you can chime in also, but like, so to me, I think where, where, where the critique gets difficult is like some of us fantasized a long time ago about outcome based sales, right. And value based sales and, and companies like only buying when, when outcomes are proven and, and, and those frankly have fallen flat. I think they're idealistic and beyond the scope, but what I do think is more realistic is this notion that that you cannot walk away from sales anymore the way you once could, right? It used to be like, oh man, I just nailed this two-year ERP engagement. Now I'm walking on to the next. Now you are going to get discredited if you take that mentality and it goes against your best interest because generally speaking, you are selling a, a series of products and you're going to want to upsell those 
and and everything that you do is judged on adoption. So so wouldn't you say there's a little bit of hope there based on Josh's post that that this will change a bit just because you're not going to you frankly you're just not going to sell more if you if you don't adapt to some of this. Yeah, and I I I do think there has to be multiple cycles that come into place. Like the initial close, yeah, you're going to try to find some sort of uh, ROI within, call it six months to two years, because you've got to have something to show for the initial sale. But I think there needs to be a, a lot more focus on that next, say, call it two to five year period. How are you setting this up to be a potential solution that works going forward? Uh, what What is the vision for having more people actually use this product over time, or how does this play well with the technologies that you have in hand? You know, is this a date or a marriage uh, at, at the end of the day? Right. And I, I'm hoping that Josh's uh, post, his perspective here will help with uh, that vision of understanding that this isn't just about adding more technology that will add more uh, technical debt and more issues and more complexity at the end of the day. This is about actually solving somebody's uh, problem. Right. Yeah. I, it should it should be the basic, you know, incentive for everyone. It should be. Yeah, yeah. And one of the so uh, one of the comments I made about your uh, blog was uh, bringing up this uh, Microsoft study that had happened right. uh, a few months ago talking about remote work and how remote work was leading in the uh, in the COVID era was leading to uh, siloed viewpoints. And I think this is, uh, and the reason I brought it up is that I, I think that's a challenge that exists on the customer side. Like that, that COVID closed down wasn't just moving to remote work, but also a very stressful situation, obviously. We had, nobody knew what they were doing in April, 2020. And so uh, our natural reaction, you know, at least Microsoft's natural reaction was for their workers to uh, hunker down and silo and just work with the people that they knew really well. And they didn't have that chief silo buster who was there to maintain relationships and understand holistic business processes. And I think that stress still exists in, in the enterprise now because we're we're going to open up somewhat, but we're going to keep a lot of remote workers out there in, in this new normal that we've got. And so I think that role for that silo buster is increasingly important. Uh, we're not just going to go back to 2019. We're going to need somebody out there to keep people from, you know, turtling up <laughs> at, at the end of the day and saying, here are the five people I'm going to work with and nobody else. And I'm going to make my three processes perfect because that's what I want to do. And I don't really want to learn anything else because it's hard and, you know, it's, it's my job. This is my job. This is not my job. <laughs> I, I think that... Instinct is going to be really strong in people for the foreseeable future because of, you know, what whatever the, the hell we've been doing the past a uh, year and a half. Josh, what was your response to that that post? I I, I pasted one version of that. A lot of people wrote about this. I put in one version of the article. But what was your response to that based on kind of your thinking on silos and? You know, and honestly, at first I'm like, I was trying to connect the dot and then, and then the sort of the, the light went off, which, you know, you just explained. This is, this is, this is a continuation of the problem. How people work together is very much a, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's sort of, it's imposed on them to a certain extent by the technology and the resources they have. And so, you know, that's what, when you just said this, it's sort of, that's, that's the click is that the chief silo buster isn't just worried about the implement the, the buying cycle, the implementation process, and the grand strategy. They need to be worried about the day-to-day -day operations of the company. So when you extend those that sense of end-to-end -end business process, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna look at you know what this report said about Microsoft and think, I gotta bust some of that too because we're we're not gonna succeed if everyone's just you know yeah turtle down. Did you say is that the term? <laughs> And, you know, I think that I think that's an important sort of additional perspective. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. And if I can just weigh in on that, I think uh, I, I've I've objected to a lot of these studies because I felt they've kind of demonized remote work in which I view as kind of a very artificial circumstance. More of a I felt it was more of an emergency app adaptation than a optimal adaptation. But having said that, like if we take the study for its word, what the study is saying is that yeah, we actually individual teams bonded better, but but cross functional teams kind of didn't do as well, and you didn't make those 
additional connections right. outside of your team, which 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 I would agree if that's true, that's pretty problematic. And I think Hines right to point that out because that does perpetuate, Josh, the problems that you're pointing to. And I think bon Bonnie Tinder's comment points to that also when she says remote work has eliminated the proverbial water cooler talk that aids in cross-functional discussion. So I do think there's a real problem that that Hyen is flagging here, Josh, pertaining to your post. Right. And, you know, and I think that's about, you know, if you look at the creative process in, in, in every way, there's, you know, in any domain, there are eureka moments that come that, that need to be captured and they don't necessarily happen in the course of doing your day-to-day -day work. I mean, they also, you know, the archetype, Archimedes gets in the bath and watches the water rise and goes, mm -hmm. literally, Eureka, in that case, that's how you measure volume. Uh, he was taking a bath. He wasn't sitting in his laboratory working, working that process. Mm -hmm. He was in the bathtub. Um, creation is, is, not a, is, not, is not prescriptive. It's, it's sometimes it's just there. And yeah, you want to capture it. Like Bonnie said, at the water cooler, wherever it happens, it doesn't happen if I don't talk to other people. That's if I can make a quick comment, if I can make a comment too to sharpen this a little bit, I think that that this study has a lot of short-term relevance in the sense that we are still working under what I would consider pandemic circumstances. In other words, um, there's a lot of offices that would be open right now that aren't for safety reasons. So I think the way this study surfaces there's immediate actions that probably should be taken to try to alleviate some of the downsides here. But once, if you can remove safety from the equation going forward, mm -hmm. uh, then, then in my mind, the future is not remote work, but flexible work. And at that point, I think we're going to have to reevaluate this because in a, in an optimal flexible work scenario, I don't think you would have people as isolated as they are now. I think you would have things like, uh, one day a week in the office, or let's have a regional meetup, or let's even have a social mixer locally for pe for colleagues that just live locally, even from different departments and divisions. So especially from different departments. Yeah, yeah right. exactly. So that's the one thing I would want to point out about these studies is I think sometimes they sort of assume that this is how remote work is always going to look, and I would argue that it's a pandemic adaptation, not a true. So, so I kind of just, I'm such a believer in flexible work that I just want to say someday flexible work will get a true like treatment outside of safety concerns and then we'll get a different set of data. And look, there may still be problems. I'm just saying it's a different situation. Yeah, there's yeah. definitely this uh, room for this, this uh, kind of third place gathering. Uh, and maybe that's something that starts happening. It's not necessarily about either being in the office or being in the place or being at home, but having this uh, you know, neutral area where people can come together to solve problems and have a kind of a cross cross departmental mental uh, cross role uh, discussions as well. Uh, something that is not just your cubicle. Something that is not just uh, trying to deal with your kids while right. you are on a Zoom call. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing that comes out in this study that I think is important is is the problem of being a junior colleague or entering the workforce. And I have some real sympathy towards that perspective also, because when I think about, I don't know about you guys, but when I think about my first work experiences, I think about how important some of that face-to-face -face time and, 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 and mentoring and that serendipitous encounter was earlier in my career. Like uh, I probably wouldn't be in this business today if not for a couple of those encounters at various trade shows. I yeah. remember one, I remember one time when I was totally broke in the, in the mid two thousands after two, you know, nine 11 and stuff. And I ran into a, a potential client at a trade show. And he said, I got your email that you said all of our marketing was wrong. He's like, I think you're right. And I want to hire you to fix it like con contractually or whatever <laughs> that bought me three years of time in this market where I would have had to do something else. And so like that, I don't really believe that that as much as I'm a believer in what we're doing now and, and, and remote stuff, I don't believe that would have happened to me. And so I'm sympath sympathetic to that. And I think we have to think about that really carefully. Absolutely. Um, I, I have a friend whose daughter started her career as a journalist this earlier this year. And she, you know, she, she's, she's in a journalistic environment, which is extremely collaborative. She's working at home in front of a screen and missing out on so much. And she knows it and, you know, wants to get back because you want that that's not how you want to start it's how old guy geezers like us can continue because we've already <laughs> built that foundation and we know each other and we've hung out together uh, but you can't start the crisp new you know remotely i don't think that works as well at all mm -hmm. 
Indeed. So I put you on the spark spot again. You, you honed in, I think, well on, on, on perhaps a critique of Josh's post around changing sales. What would be your response in terms of if you, if you were working with, with customers who wanted to get a better handle on this problem and, 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 and address some of their silos and have better project outcomes, what kinds of things would you be talking with them about? Yeah. So one of the issues, uh, one of the practical issues I do run into is in, uh, say, IT finance. So let's get very tactical for a second. Um, this is typically a role that goes across um, IT, procurement, tax, legal, and finance. And if you don't have that team of uh, stakeholders that come together, uh, you're going to end up wasting 20 to 30 percent of costs in specific uh, costs. Uh, IT cost areas, but you have to know that that problem exists and you have to be able to bring those people together and they don't necessarily want to talk to each other. You know what, if you're an IT, uh, <laughs> you, you don't have your, your friends and procurement and tax uh, without, you know, some additional effort, you know, you, you don't hang out in accounting meetings all day. Uh, you know, it's, it can be hard to find these people. So there has to be this uh, kind of outreach in terms of finding people with common concerns. Um, the IT person needs to find that accounting person who deals with I, uh, okaying IT bills and IT contracts. And that doesn't happen without some uh, external work. Uh, it, it, to some extent, it's like going back to that first year of your career when you are going out hungry and meeting out with everybody. You know, that, that becomes a problem, again, as you're creating some, some of these cross-functional teams. A and then you have to decide how to track that work and work with that because you're all using these different applications because again these enterprise software companies have all stuck us all in you know different places to track the same stuff you know so we have all have six way different ways of uh, looking at the same thing uh, but but you know that's an issue that I come to, uh, that I deal with very often in my particular space <laughs> classic mm -hmm. Josh you have any questions for our special guests uh, how, you know, how do you build those synergies? I think it's the big question. What is, how do you make that community spontaneously happen? I mean, I don't know if there's a magic bullet, but this is, this is the trick. And whoever that chief, what are we calling him? The chief silo buster is, you know, gonna, whoever that is, they're going to have to have that talent. Right. And, and it's, and it's different, you know, different skill sets for different things. Like, you know, who knows the you know, synergies between sales and product where people need to work together. You know, that's, I'm sure, complicated uh, way outside of my uh, line of work. But I, I just know that, you know, there seem to be a lot of missed opportunities because in briefings all the time, I we talk about you know, product issues and there's always seem to be product weaknesses, but yet customers bring them up all the time. So what's leading to this disconnect between the people who are talking to the customers and the people who are, you know, building the product? Actually, yeah. Right. It's a big problem. Uh-huh. Well, Josh, it took us an hour, but I think we got to the bottom of your bottom of your post. Did we really? Well, then I'll have to write another one. Yeah. Uh, really? Yeah. I think we just got to the top. I think we just started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, the, like I said, it could be a book, really, that post. So there's there's no possible hope of really getting to it all in, in an hour. But I... I feel pleased, nevertheless, with our progress, and and it's a reminder to those of you out there who who blog about the enterprise that if your blog is really outstanding, you're going to get a blogs that matter treatment just like this. Just maybe that's the treatment. Maybe that's a disincentive rather than an incentive. But uh, but 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 look, I mean, I I think it's really important to share these things in the public domain. So hopefully, more will do so. Um, well, Hyun, you. you Hyun, you lived up to expectations. I knew you were going to have some great content. So hopefully, we can have you back for other appearances, but thank you so much for taking the time today as well. My pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Good to okay. see you again. Okay, folks. Well, most Fridays at four Eastern time, we're going to do some variation of this, but not probably not every single one because long story short, but my show as spontaneous as it might appear, it takes often a lot of prep time, especially with new people. So, but most Fridays will be here. Thanks for coming. See you next time. Thank you. Good to see you both.